As of March 23, 2022, we will no longer receive ad revenue for any video on this channel, even though YouTube still sells advertising on it. The reason, as we've been told, is because we are a channel that presents historical content as opposed to original content. We refuse to be blacked out. We need your support. Please buy Real Black merchandise from the Real Black store. Make a donation through PayPal or Cash App or by joining our Patreon so that we can have the resources necessary to keep the channel growing. Please join our mailing list by sending an email to realblackinc at live.com and follow us on social media at Real Black so that you can stay informed of future projects created outside of this platform. Real Black 2 is our backup YouTube channel that carries new original content plus classics from the Real Black Vault that will be monetized. We ask that you also subscribe there. Thank you. Hey everybody, this is Mike and I'm with Charles Woods. And this is a very, very special edition of the Real Black Podcast. Uh, with us today, we have Ellie Mistow, who is the author of Allow Me to Retort. Let me read from the uh, liner notes, if you if you don't mind, Charles. MSNBC legal court commentator Ellie Mistow thinks that Republicans are wrong about the law almost all the time. Now, instead of talking about this on cable news, Mistow explains why in his first book. Allow me to retort is an easily digestible argument about what rights we have, what rights Republicans are trying to take away, and how to stop them. Ms. Dow explains how to protect the rights of women and people of color instead of cowering to the absolutism of gun owners and bigots. He explains the legal way to stop everything from police brutality to political gerrymandering just by changing a few judges and justices. He strips out all the fancy jargon conservatives hide, like to hide behind and lays bare the truth of their political, of their project to keep America forever tethered to its slave holding past. Ellie Mistal is the nation's justice correspondent and Alfred Nobler fellow and at the Type Media Center and the legal editor of the More Perfect podcast on the Supreme Court for Radio Lab. He is a graduate of Harvard Law College and Harvard Law School, the former executive editor of Above the Law, a former associate at Debevoise and Plimpton, and a frequent guest on MSNBC and Sirius XM. He lives in New York. Welcome to the Real Black Podcast, Mr. Mistel. Mike, Mr. Woods, thank you for having me. So thank you so much for having me. Well, the first the first thing before we jump into the book, um, as we speak th this week is uh, the uh, the Supreme Court nominations for Katanji Katanji Brown Jackson. Do you have any hot takes for us? Yeah, uh, hot takes. The the she's eminently qualified. Um, she was always the front runner. I've been joking that. You know, it was great that Biden said that he was going to nominate the first black woman. Literally anybody else who was running for the Democratic primary could have said the same thing. Coffin man, mayor stop and frisk, they all could have said the same thing because Ketanji Brown Jackson was that good. She was always the front runner for this job, and it looks like she's she's going to get it. I think with the Joe Manchin coming on board and now um, uh, Susan Collins coming on board, that should get you to 50 so uh, I, I think she's going to get this uh, a job, and it's well earned. Ellie, welcome. What's up? Um, I told Mike about you. I said, man, we have the opportunity because Ellie just wrote a book. I've seen you, I think, first on um, Ari Melba's show. And I said, when this cat comes on, Tell us what you really think. <laughs> this brother does not hold back. Ar Ari's great. For yeah. he's, uh, he's really given me a, a platform. And I always like to say that, like, you know, when, uh, back this is back in the day when you could go in studio, you know. Um, people always kind of make fun of Ari's rap references. But I'm going to tell you, that's what's on his phone. All right? Like, when his, <laughs> like, when his iPod or, or, or whatever is playing – He's got NOS on his phone. So, like, he comes by those references uh, honestly, man. Well, you've got a lot of movie references in this book. I, I listened to the audio version. Now, is it true that you wanted Samuel L. Jackson 
to do the book before you? I did because the because allow me to retort. It's his line from Pulp Fiction, right? Oh, oh, you were finished. Oh well, allow me to retort, right? And then he kind of goes off, and I thought that would be cool. I his people said no, which uh, I think is understandable. Um, I didn't actually get to talk to the man himself, obviously. Um, uh, but w at, once that pipe dream went away, I decided to read it myself. I think it was useful. Look, I try, and if you've read the book, you know that I try to put it in plain English. English. I try to take the jargon out. I try to make it um, so that everybody can understand it, not dumb it down, because I don't think people are dumb. I think, and I don't think dumbing it down helps anybody. So trying to keep the, the intellectualism up but explain it in, in, in terms that most people can understand. I think reading it, you know, myself, since I know the terms that I'm dealing with, you can kind of put the right emphasis here and there um, on certain terms and, and, and certain words. So I think that probably helped. Uh, pro if you listen to the audiobook, it probably helps you even understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. No, it's a fantastic audiobook and a fantastic book. Um, we met at the, shout out to the Free Library of Philadelphia, which is where we met. But, Ooh, uh, can I, we jump, jump into it, or we got the um, question? I just wanted to get Ellie's take on um, how th these suckers went after Katanji Jackson, and had nothing to do with her knowledge of the law. It was all dog whistles. Um, we talked. To, you, you talked about Susan Collins, who announced that she's going to vote for Miss um, Jackson, but. I think Ben Sass, we may get Ben Sass's vote. What do you think? Uh, Sass said he was not because huh. Sass, like, yeah, he came out as a no. Sass likes to pretend to be a reasonable Republican, but he ain't. He's he is he is just like he is just as rabidly conservative and hypocritical as a Lindsey Graham or a Ted Cruz. He just doesn't yell and whine as much as the rest of them. But Sass is you know, Sass is always on my on my on my down list because he's fake. He's he's a he's a fake individual. Look for the party that confirmed a judge over attempted rape allegations for a party that wasn't even willing to investigate those attempted rape, rape allegations for a party that wouldn't put his friends who could have testified to it under oath, who let the FBI director, his buddy from law school conduct that what investigation there was for that party to come around on the other side and say they have some problems because of what a judge did. No, 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 not what she did personally. Everybody agrees that Kataji Brown Jackson has lived an exemplary life free of even a whiff of scandal and <laughs> sexual harassment. Um, but to then criticize her for her sentencing as a judge in five out of the 570 cases that she's presided over, the hypocrisy just drips from the ceiling with these people. Th that they had to go to calling her an advocate for pedophilia shows just how far afield they are, shows just how dirt deep they had to dig to get anything on this woman who has prepared basically her life for this job. The only thing that I want people to understand is that the reason why they did that is to excite their violent and dangerous QAnon base. Mm -hmm. They know that when they make these attacks, their most virulent and violent supporters get excited, right? They know that they are putting Katanji Brown Jackson and her family at risk when they, when they do this. I know they know that because one of the cases that they didn't talk about that Katanji Brown Jackson presided over, um, she sentenced the guy who was involved in Pizzagate. So remember, there was this violent guy in D.C. He went, he tried to shoot people. He thought there was a, a pedophile ring happening in the basement of a pizza parlor. There was no basement, much less a pedophile ring there. So he got sentenced to four years by Katanji Brown Jackson. So there's a little bit of, so from where I sit, there's a little bit of payback here as well. Not only are they doing it to, to rile up the Q base, they are, they know that the Q base already knows this woman, already doesn't like this woman because she sentenced one of their heroes to four years in prison. So it's, it was very, I think, insidious. I think it was very dangerous um, what they, what they did, what they tried to do. Um, she's going to come through. She's going to come through it. Um, but you shouldn't ever let the Republicans off the hook, whether they be the 
dripping hypocrisy of Lindsey Graham or the silent assassin of Ben Sass. You should never let these people all off the hook for the dirt that they try to do. And Lindsey Graham is not racist because he wanted Charles instead of Jackson. Right? I mean, look, they, they, they're, there's always some other black woman in the room that they totally would have supported, just not the one in front of them. You know, one of the funny things about, about the Republicans there is that Lindsey Graham kept pointing out about how, oh, they, they tried to nominate uh, Janice uh, Rogers Brown, and they wanted her to, to, to be a Supreme Court justice. But you'll note that they never nominated her for the Supreme Court. Right, she was she was put on the D.C. Circuit in 2003. That Lindsey Graham was going all the way back to a confirmation battle in 2003. Whenever he brought her name up, do you want me to tell you how many justices the Republicans appointed after 2003? I will, because I know John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett. What do those five people have in common? They're all white. They're all white. So, like, when Lindsey Graham says, oh, they were just about to appoint a black person, man, they have five chances to appoint anybody of color. You know? They could have appointed somebody who was a good tan, and, and, they didn't, and they didn't do it. Well, let's jump into the book. The first question we have is a little loaded, but to set the table, is America systemically racist? Ellie? Yes. Okay. Of course. It's written in our <laughs> Our, our founding documents are the, the, the racism and the and the apartheid rule is written into our document. The Constitution is designed to always allow for kind of my, minority white rule because it gives equal suffrage in the Senate to states, not people. Right. And it turns out that people of color, even as we become a browning country, even as we head towards a majority minority country, people of color are not evenly spread out around this country. Most black people still live in the states where our ancestors were enslaved, right? The, the highest population of uh, the highest black population um, by population in the state is Mississippi, and then it's Louisiana, and then it's Georgia, right? That's where black, most black people still live. Most Latinos still live in Texas, California, you know the states. Most Asian Americans live in New York, California. We're on the coasts. We're in the south. There ain't a whole lot of people of color in Idaho. There ain't a whole lot of people of color in Wyoming. But those states get just as much um, Senate representation as the big states. I've, I pointed out a couple of times, if North Dakota and South Dakota combined get four senators, how many senators should Queens get, which has twice the po Queens, New York, which has twice the population of the Dakotas combined? Mm. And the answer is Queens gets zero senators. It gets a say in one of the two senators that New York gets to represent, right? So, like, the, the imbalance is, again, written into the very document. Right. So you say the core premise of the book is that the Constitution is trash. Yeah, I'm surprised that's been a bit of a controversial statement. It's been, it's, I think it's pretty obvious, right? The, the, the Constitution was written by slavers, white male slavers, white male colonists, and white male abolitionists who nonetheless were willing to make deals with slavers and colonists. Like, I wouldn't have made a deal with them. But they, these, these alleged abolitionists were willing to make a deal with them. I, nobody of color was allowed to vote on on the was allowed to write the documents or write the amendments or vote on the ratification thereof. No women were allowed a say or allowed to vote or allowed to participate in the discussions around the Constitution. The idea that this slaver's document written two, uh, 250 years ago represents the best we can do as a society is just ridiculous on its face. Of course, it's not very good. Look, we only get... Any document written by, like, one kind of person is going to have some obvious gaps, right? Like, I, you don't even, like, you, 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 wouldn't re, you wouldn't watch a Netflix show if it's only written by one kind of person, right? You need more, as Kermit the Frog might say, you need more dogs and cats and bears and chickens and things um, to make your show work, right? So the, the, the idea that the Constitution is some kind of sacred document is just... It's laughable on its face. Um, Ellie, even from the get-go, you had a number of, of um, 
delegates who refused to sign the Constitution because it protected slavery and and um and the slave trade. Also, some didn't want to sign the document because it didn't include the Bill of Rights. Right. Right. So so the that you're talking about the the Federalist anti Federalist debate. So you got to remember that the people who wrote it the James Madison's and Thomas Jefferson's and Alexander Hamilton's, they didn't think the Constitution needed amendments. They thought that the, the government was fine just as it is. It was what's called the anti-federalists who thought the Constitution needed amendments. And some of the key things they wanted to protect were their rights to hold slaves. So in the book, I talk about the true origins of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment has nothing to do with personal self-defense. That was That's some bollocks that Republicans made up yesterday. It has nothing to do with self-defense. It has everything to do with slaves with and controlling the slaves, right? Because it turns out, and this is going to come as a galloping, this isn't going to come as a galloping shock, shock for most of your listeners, but it turns out Holding people in bondage against their will is hard. You need to <laughs> outnumber them, both in terms of population, and you need to, to overwhelm them in terms of military force. Now, overall, the, the white Southerners both outnumbered and outgunned the enslaved population in the American South. This was not true in every country. Uh, my family goes back to Haiti. Numbers got reversed, so you see what happens, right? Um, but in America, white people outnumber the black people and they have more guns. But that population advantage didn't hold in every part of the South. Virginia, for instance, was 44, was almost 40 percent enslaved humans. Right. And so there were parts of Virginia where black people outnumbered the white people there were parts of South Carolina where black people outnumbered the white people. Right. So occasionally slaves on those plantations would rise up in revolt. How would those were slave revolts? be put down. The militia, the well-regulated militia was raised up to come and crush the slave revolt. Very Roman-esque, right, in terms of how they did it. So in the original constitution, it wasn't clear that the states were going to have the power to raise the militia to defend themselves from the slave revolts, right? So what the anti-federalists want, and this is, you know, George Mason, governor of Virginia, Patrick Henry, um, delegate in Virginia, They've argued in public that that they had a problem because the North, I'm quoting them, detests slavery. And they were afraid that if the federal government was dominated by Northerners and the North and the federal government could raise the militia, then they wouldn't raise the militia to come put down the slave revolts. And that's why they wanted the Second Amendment, so that they could arm and discipline their own state militias so they could go crush the slave revolts. That's why it's there, folks. That's but, why we but, have. But the, Ellie, that's why. That's why we have the Second Amendment. We didn't have slave revolts, didn't we? Have happy darkies? <laughs> they always want to. That's been one of the weirdest pushbacks that I've gotten from this book, right? Like that people are always trying. Oh, well, you know, they had slavery everywhere. Well, not not like they had it here in America. There's a reason why we call it chattel slavery. The idea that you could inherit slavery as a condition. See, in the old world, in Europe, in, in ancient times, in Egypt, in Rome, slavery was a, you had to conquer your slaves, right? You had to go out, beat somebody at war, and bring back the slaves to your territory. You couldn't, you couldn't inherit slave, slavery. That was gross. To the Assyrians, to the Romans, that was gross, right? In a, it's, an Ameri it's an American invention. And by America, in this context, I mean the Americas, the New World. It's a new world invention to have slavery be something that is passed down generation after generation with no opportunity for getting out of that other than the grace of your owner. That's, that, is, that is something relatively distinct to the new world. That's why we call it chattel slavery. You could never get out. So it's this, completely different than, what, than the kinds of slavery that was practiced in the old world and in the ancient world. This is going to segue into the question we have for you about reparations because slavery was all about cheap labor they first oh. attempted to enslave the, the native Amer uh, the indians that didn't work out we had the indentured servants you had blacks as well as uh, whites as indentured but 
cheap labor and the wealth that was accrued from that slave labor, what about reparation? Obviously, I'm for it. My only issue is that a lot of times, you know, I think the conversation sometimes gets warped into uh, conversations of like, oh, well, what, what are we having the reparations for, right? So like, there are some people who think that the reparations, you have to trace back your roots to here, um, going at least back to 1865, right, end of the Civil War. That's one way of doing it, I suppose. But I mean, white people were bombing the wealth out of Tulsa in the 20th century, right? Like they were to white people were stealing black labor and underpaying black people and stealing black wealth well into the 20th century, right? So I mean, I'm for reparations, but like honestly, man, I, there's a part of me that's like, I don't start the clock until like 1984. All right, like like. Jesse Jackson runs for president in 1984. That's about when I feel, you know, put like this. If I can go, if I had a time machine, right, I don't want to go back in America earlier than 1984. At about once Jesse Jackson is kind of established and he's running for president and the Democrats realize that, like, black people vote too and maybe we should care about, like, then things start to kind of, I think then things start to improve. But much earlier than that, there's just a lot of pilfering. <laughs> of black wealth, talent, and labor in this country. So my issue with the reparations is always like, well, when do you? It's it's not how far back should you go. It's like how more, how recently are you allowed to really stop, right? Because there, there there's there's some atrocities happen in America at all points, and certainly well into the 20th century. Yeah, let's let's get into because you have a chapter called the taking of black land. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, and and how it relates to the Constitution. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, so the weirdly, the most conservative part of my book is what you're talking about, right? Um, because I'm dealing with the Fifth Amendment's um, grants of eminent domain. That means that the government can't come in and say, we want your land, and they can just take it from you and build what the government says that it wants. Now, philosophically, eminent domain makes perfect sense, right? You, you have to have it. Like, if you're, if you're the government and you're at war, and you need my land to build a wall, right, to stop the foreign nation from taking over the country, like my land is forfeit. That's that's just how it has to be, right? So I get it. I get I get the that the government has to have a, be, a way to take land and repurpose it for public purposes, right? And war being the obvious example, but there are lots of other ones. Like I think they should be able to take land to keep historical sites going. They should probably be able to take land to build a hospital. They should probably be able to take land and build solar panels. But should they be able to take land and build a sports stadium? Mm. Should they be able to take land to build a mall? Should they be able to take land to build a highway? You see, like it, the government will always have a reason for taking your stuff. And it always happens that the land that they take, it's never the rich, connected white folks who get their land taken, right? Like, if we need to build, think about right now, we got climate change, we probably need to build some more levees, some sandbars, right? When, when they go to Florida and take some land to build the new levees, it ain't going to be Mar-a-Lago, right? It ain't going to be the rich, connected, white Republican land. It's always the poor black land. It's always the, the, the land of the people who are, if not black, then they're brown. They're unconnected. They don't have good legal representation. And their land gets taken from them on the cheap then sold to billionaires who then develop that land and then they can't even afford to like so so this is this is what this is the story of gentrification right they take your land mm -hmm. they give you slum prices they redevelop your neighborhood so it's actually nice and now you can't afford to live there so you got to go find some other slum to live in but now that other slum doesn't have all your people there doesn't have your community there. So now you start to fall through the cracks, right? Because your your old slum, at least you knew the deacon, at least you knew the guy at the 7-Eleven who could like float you uh, you know, you know, street credit, like true street credit. You know, you're good for it in a couple of in a couple of days, my friend. Right. But now you go to this new slum and you don't have those connections and you fall through the cracks. So like this is what happens. This is how uh, this is how poverty turns into homelessness. This is how homelessness turns into destitution. This is how destitution turns into death. And it happens all the time. And it happens in part because of this 
idea we have about the government's use of eminent domain and when it's okay for the government to take people's land. So I'm not saying that the government can't take land. I'm saying it needs to have a real, real good reason. And like football stadium is not one of them. And it needs to pay people, not what, not the slum prices. It needs to pay people what their land would be worth if people cared about that land. Right. Yeah. You talk about the value of Central Park. Yep. So I, I, I do this whole chapter on Seneca Village. Seneca Village was a free independent land owning village of black people in the middle of Manhattan. About 220 black families owned their land. They could vote. This is back in the 19th century, before the 15th Amendment, before the Civil War, when literally 10% of New York's black voting population lived in Seneca Village. And they took it from them. In 1857, they took it from them to build Central Park. And now Central Park, the real estate right next to Central Park, is some of the most valuable real estate on earth. And these people got, you know, $3,000 for their acres of land in the middle of Central Park. That's go. So I said, you know, go find them. Go find the people of Seneca Village and start by giving reparations to them because mm -hmm. their land was worth billions and they should get a little cut of that. Central Park. So, Central Park, which, by the way, I didn't even put this in the book, but Central Park, which, of course, you know, it was very hard for, for black people to get to when it was first built. The, this park that was supposed to be for everybody, they, they designed it so it was actually difficult for poor people and black people to even get to the park, much less enjoy a nice, you know, afternoon stroll there. It's just, right. Well, one, one, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the channel is how integration led to our disintegration but it seems like it's even more insidious when you examine the law. Yeah, I mean, did integration lead to disintegration? I mean, like, I think I, it's it's always a provocative statement. I think that's true in some cases, right? When you look at the Negro Leagues, right? The Negro Leagues were doing fine. The Negro Leagues were doing fine. They were independent and it was great baseball, and it, right? Um, did integration kill the Negro Leagues? Yeah, absolutely. Kill the Negro Leagues helped major league baseball and you know did the negro leaguers ever get the full value of their contribution you know those first uh, baseball major league black major league baseball players did they ever get the full value of their of their contribution probably not on the other hand without jackie robinson i mean so much progress doesn't happen like jackie rob like People think that it's sports and so it, that it's not as important. No, without without people like Jackie Robinson, without people like Sidney Poitier, you don't get people like Barack Obama. Like it, it you just can't make that connection without these people. So there, there, there are costs, but there are definitely benefits as well. I come back to this idea of making sure people get the full value, right? Of what of what they've done, right? So I think it's, for instance, right now critically important that we fund. HBCUs, right? I didn't go to one, but I know a lot of people did, and I, I and I who do, and I I know a lot of people who have been able to. Uh, what's where I'm looking? It's a slightly nuanced point, but they've been able to develop their minds and their confidence without the oppressive structures of white supremacy just like leaning on them. You know what I mean? Just like mm -hmm. leaning on the whole time when they're kids. Like I'm lucky. I, I went to Harvard, obviously, but like I was a kind of a confident kid. I was, I was, I had some skills, some, some ability to kind of defend myself. I think uh, against some of the, some of the white supremacy that I kind of experienced in my life, but n not every kid has that. Not every kid has those, those, those foundations. And I think, making sure that there are still places in this world where you can learn free of um, uh, the corrupting influence of white supremacy is critically important. So while I think overall it is good that colleges and universities are integrated, I'm very happy I was able to go to Harvard. You know, I'm very happy for W.E.B. Du Bois who blazed um, that trail for me and people like me. Um, but at the same token, we need to take some of the gains from integration and make sure that we're putting it back in to things like HBCUs and, th and, and, and things in our community um, to make sure that people have a path up that doesn't require um, 
interacting interacting is not the right word that that doesn't require uh, uh, subs, being subservient to the white man. Hey, are you enjoying this conversation? So am I. Now remember, the only way to watch the whole interview, the one hour version of this interview, is to be a member of Patreon, our Patreon page. Donate as little as $3 a month and have access to exclusive bonus features like the full interview that we, me and Charles had with Ellie Mistow.